Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. This is God's day. I hope you've come to worship God. This worship service, like all of the ones that we are privileged to host, uh, are created so that you are able to come and open and give your heart to God. And you may be coming from a, a different place from everybody else in this sanctuary. You may be just like the person next to you. I don't know. But our hope and our prayer is that this hour together, 45 minutes they tell me, this moment together is helpful in you giving your heart to God. That's what he wants from you. And we only have so many times a week we do that together. So let's make the most of it this morning. Amen? My name is Paul Carpenter. I'm the senior pastor here. And uh, behind me is our, our fairly newly formed praise band. They're excellent. And uh, we hope that uh, God's blessing is with us this morning. We also know that you can worship anywhere today. We also know that you could stay in bed today. And we want to thank you for coming and, 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 and blessing us with your presence. Because as we pray together and break bread together and listen to God's word together, the more the merrier. We thank you for bringing your heart and your story. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, we bow before you and we ask that you bless us with the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray as the church was designed in you, that you would reign in us all the gifts we need to worship you well. Lord, we're sheep, we're not the smartest of creatures, and so we pray that you would guide us into worship. We pray that even if we're shooting in the dark sometimes, we pray that just our desire to please you, Lord, just our hope to please you, pleases you. We ask these things and ask your uh, Son, Jesus Christ, to bless us in the name of him, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Will you please stand and join us as we begin our worship service this morning with Hosanna, praise is rising. Hi there. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. See you, we find strength to face the day. It's in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Oh, 
We had a wonderful week of BBS. We learned how to imagine and build with God. And now we're going to do a song for y'all. And I want to thank everyone who's involved and helped support the BBS. We had a great time. Well, we had lots of transformations this week during BBS, and I think we have one special transformation to show y'all. Hi, I'm Scott Hall. Your youth and family ministry maiden person here at First Christian Church. This week at VBS, we had something very unique. It was called the Transformation Chamber. 
Now, in the transformation chamber, our clients every week would walk into the chamber and they would be transformed into someone new until the end of the week where we realized that it was really the Bible that was transforming all these people who went into the chamber. However, we found something kind of peculiar the other day. Um, we happened to find a video of our very own Paul Carpenter and his uh, encounter with the Transformation Chamber. Check it out. Time for my secret Aggie Yell Leader ritual. We need to pray after that. <laughs> Be careful when you walk into that chamber. There are several things we need to lift up this morning. You're a bulletin insert. I guess this worship, it's kind of backwards compared to the other service. The main portion of your bulletin has a list of prayer concerns. And as a prayerful people, you know our ministry and our prayer time isn't just on Sunday morning. That's a cliche, I know. But it's when you get home. Take this home with you. Take it home with you. If you have to tape it on your steering wheel or put it on your counter where you get ready in the bathroom in the morning, take this with you. And, and when, you're, when, you've, uh, when you're praying, give each person at least 30 seconds. It makes a big difference in the lives of these people that we'll be praying for. Our church has experienced miracles very recently. We shared with you last week, Lori Wilson, who was determined to be brain dead. Everyone counted her out, as, except as Jim says, except God. Just over 72 hours of her being told, our family being told that she's not going to live any longer, she's walking. She's talking, she's eating full meals, and now she's back home. So, yeah. I left some of my notes today uh, after, the, after the first service. We had one person, uh, I believe her name was Kathy, and I can get it to you. Carrie Palmer. Karen Palmer. We found out last year she was diagnosed with cancer and has been battling it. She did a, had a scan run last week, and she's completely cancer-free. Amen. And uh, we've had just several good things happen in our congregation recently. And we've had a few people ask us for prayer. One on the, on the top of your list is Gypsy Taylor. Gypsy fell and, and broke her, or fractured her hip, cracked it this week. And uh, the doctors have determined that through rehab and time, she'll heal up just fine. So please pray for that to happen well. Uh, and Deerdorf, last name. Larry Deerdorf. Man, y'all are good. Larry Deerdorf this week is having knee replacement surgery. So pray that that would go well. You know, if you've had that done, the day of the surgery, they have you up bending your leg. So prayers for... Uh, his pain tolerance and for that to happen, for his recovery to happen quickly. Last week we uh, lifted up Eloise and uh, for John. Is, is there anybody else uh, that you know of that we need to be praying for this morning? Is there anything that you're joyful about that you'd like to offer God publicly? Robin? Amen. If you didn't hear, Robin, her family sponsors a, a child out of Nigeria uh, that's, that disappeared. And that's a scary thing over there. And, uh, and the child surfaced in Madagascar, and it was a good reason that they disappeared. Praise be to God. Randall?
Somebody, somebody you know, that's accepted God just passed away? Okay. Amen. Sorry for the loss and amen for, the, for his, his eternal life. Thank you, Randall. Okay. If there's no others, let's bow our heads and offer our hearts and our prayers to God. Lord, we know that we, in our own right, have no reason, or no, um, we have all the reason, we have no authority, uh, no right to walk into your throne room and lift up our, our prayers before you and ask you to be at work. In fact, the world lived like that for so long until your son Jesus Christ came and changed things and gave us a new covenant, a new relationship with you. And until he revealed to us that you're not some set-apart angry God, but that you're our father, our dad in heaven. Those of us who are parents in this room and those of us who have parents in this room know how how important it is to speak with our parents on a regular basis and and, and how even further, Lord, that you're our Father, how important it is for us to, to speak with you and offer our voices and our hearts up to you, how that brings you great joy. We also know, Lord, through experience and through the scriptures and through what we've just felt in our congregation the past few weeks, that prayer works. It's effective. It's powerful. And so we bring these things that have been lifted up to you, the things that worry us, and also the things that bring us joy. We bring them in your midst and cheer you on as you get to work perfecting these things. We also, in our hearts, lift up the things that steal our peace, our worries, Lord. In this moment, we name silently the things that bring anxiety and pain in our lives, things that may be trying to creep up in our hearts and our minds this very moment. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would be at work perfecting and dealing with these things that steal your son's peace from us. Lord, we pray for relationships that we're in that just aren't right, people that bug us to no end. We pray for people that, um, that we wish we had a better relationship with, Lord, and we pray that you would be at work blessing them and blessing us too. We pray for forgiveness of our sins, for the things that we've done knowingly and for the things that uh, we chose not to do when you, we know that you've called us to do them. We ask in Jesus' name that you wipe that clean from us. And so that we would use that forgiveness to be free to try again, free for you, not free from you or from others. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place in the next few minutes, after being fed through your word and through your table, we pray that you would find us worthy, that you would find us able, that you would find us trustworthy and faithful to carry out a smidget of your work on earth. We pray that your kingdom would be done through us. And we pray that you would always be proud and joyous when you look upon how we spend the time and the money and the goods that you give us on this side of heaven. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting this morning, we're going to start a new tradition. We'll have two scripture readings instead of just the one. And on the first scripture reading, we're going to read it in unison. And so uh, to make us kind of wake up and do this well, let's all stand up if you're able. We will read the reading off the screen. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You may be seated. Our second scripture reading is from another of Paul's pastoral letters. Last week we were in Colossians. This week we're in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And I pray that God's blessing would fall upon the reading and the hearing and the understanding of these words. So then, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together 
and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Let us pray. Father, we ask this hour that has promised that you would feed your sheep through the power of your Spirit and through your Word. We ask to do this, that you would pour into me the gift of preaching, and that you would pour into your church a hunger and a thirst to be fed by your Word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. Beginning last week, we started a three-week sermon series and a sermon focus that hopefully goes past the sermon into the Sunday school classes and into your homes, where we're asking some why questions, some purpose questions to what we're doing at the, at the church. And I intentionally set this series up because being a new pastor, there's hope and anticipation and energy and momentum. And I wanted to capture that for a moment and make sure we didn't run off in a billion directions because, you know, there's, there's, there's ministry and then there's busyness. And sometimes they're not the same thing. And so this sermon series is all about pausing at the feet of Jesus Christ and asking some basic questions to reorient and recalibrate the vision for the church. And these are the same questions that any congregation should be asking, not just First Christian Church. Churches all around the world that can have answers to these three questions, that can articulate what they're doing, they have a much more fruitful, focused streamline natural ministry because you know like the church us we were designed to do ministry right it shouldn't be that hard it should be fun it should be natural and so we started the series last week and 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 uh, i was thinking this week on um, the difference between in any organization between having people that manage things and having people that lead and you need both Every organization has managers and has leaders, the church included, civic organizations, uh, businesses that you've probably been a part of. The world's full of managers, right? And to draw the distinction between the two, I, was, uh, I came across a story a couple of years ago about a group of people that was uh, charged with forging a path through a jungle, a thick jungle. And their job was to forge this so perfectly and quickly and widely that, that families behind could march through it easily and feel protected. And so this group went out, and, and they went out and they started hacking at the, hacking at the woods and hacking at the, the vines and everything. And the managers in the group did an excellent job. They kept all the machetes sharp, and they got the right people the right tools. That was their job. The manager's job was about efficiency, sharpness, execution, and making sure everyone was motivated. Okay? The lead, those are managers. The leader, on the other hand, was the person who climbed up on the ladder, high, high, high above the tree line, and started screaming, Hey, we're in the wrong jungle. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big difference between being a manager and being a leader. And in the church, our ladder climber, our leader, is the Word of God. That's, it's not me. It's not your board chair. It's not the elders. We facilitate that, but it's the Word of God who climbs up on that ladder high, high, high above his people and calls out, hey, you're in the right jungle or the wrong jungle. And so this series is all about listening for God's Word to call out to us and let us know whether we're not in the right jungle. Does that make sense? Okay. So last week we started uh, with, with one of three questions, and the question was, why does the world need... Why does the world need Jesus? Why does the world need Jesus Christ? And I heard so many answers, great answers, even from the children. Homer's class uh, shared a few answers with us. And, and the main answer we, we came up with here from the scriptures from John chapter 1 and from Colossians chapter 1 had to do with the way the world was made. And the scriptures teach that Jesus Christ was present, not only present, but everything that you see and everything you can't see in all of creation was made through Jesus Christ. Everything that you see and everything you can't see was made for Jesus Christ. And everything that is and is unseen was, is being currently held together by Jesus Christ. And so, why does the world need Jesus Christ? Because unless you know Christ, unless you've been encountered with Him and you submit to Him, you aren't fully made yet. Jesus is the one who makes us. You can be alive, technically. Jesus said several times, let the dead bury the undead, right? He said that He's kind of used this weird language saying that unless you know me and my spirit, 
You might be breathing, but you're not created fully. Wow. Why does the world need Jesus Christ? Because without Jesus Christ, they're not the world. They're not themselves. Jim's not Jim without Jesus. And so this week, to build on top of that question is a second question. Can you all hear me okay? We've done some changes to the sound system. Okay, make sure that's not a distraction. The second question that we have this week is, why does the world need, we had it up there before, why does the world need the church? Okay? Now, we agreed last week that the world needs Jesus Christ. Articulating it was the issue. We know that the world's desperate for Jesus Christ, even if we don't know it. Even if much of the unbelieving world acts like it doesn't need Jesus. But what about the church? Is it really necessary? Does the world really need the church? I mean, my generation says, I'm uh, spiritual, but I'm not religious. I believe in Jesus, but I don't go to church. This has got me thinking. I mean, that, I used to get annoyed by that. Oh, you need to get to church. And, and so it started to get me to think, for real, like, why does the world need the church? I think that's a good, honest question. Does the world need the church? And to help answer that question... I'm asking us today, instead of getting really deep, to drill really deep into Scripture, I want us to instead fly really high above the Scriptures and to look at the entire story of God. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is the story of God. Who's the main character in the Bible? God's the main character in the Bible. We're not the main character. The Hebrews aren't the main character. King David's not the main character. God's story is the Bible. And we have the Scripture, and and you and I take it for granted that we have it revealed to us. But if you step back for a minute, you and I can see... Something that the world didn't know before. God showed on his own good will his plan. He didn't have to, but he did. And there's part of this plan that drives me crazy. It's highly, highly risky, I think. But it's his plan, so I'm not going to argue with him. And God showed in the scriptures that his story can be broken down into five distinct movements. The first movement is that God made everything. God created the world. The second move is that God did something wild. He created something called covenants. He went to mortals, to sinners like us, and said, I choose to insert my life and my goodness into you and to partner with you in doing my work. Personally, I think God could do it better all by himself, but I'm not God. God chose to enter into covenants with people, right? That's the majority of the Old Testament. Genesis 1 through 11 is all the creation and and Noah's Ark, and then finally Genesis 12 through through uh, Malachi, I guess, is the last book in the Old Testament. It's all about the covenants that God created with the Hebrew people in the world. And some of these covenants were created uh, for certain individual families. Some of them were created for the entire world, like the rainbow. That's the first covenant. Some covenants were created through Abraham, that the people would be chosen and given a land, and they would be used as a blessing for the rest of the world. But God humbled God's self in order to do that. He slowed down a bit. He didn't act so swiftly as he did when he spoke. Remember, he spoke existence. He, He partnered with humans. The third movement in the scriptures and the story of God is the reason we're all here today. Christ. For 33 years, there was not one single piece of scripture written. For 33 years, the prophets stopped speaking. Because God showed up in the flesh. God spoke for himself. Scriptures teach in John chapter 1 that Jesus Christ is the image of God put into flesh. The word of God put into flesh. God put on flesh and moved into our neighborhood for 33 years. That's the Christ event. That's a huge part of the story. And God, through Christ, was conceived of the Holy Spirit, was born. We know the whole deal. Lived and performed miracles. And, and I love that he revealed to us the mystery of God's kingdom. He healed. He preached. He showed the power of God. He died. He rose again. And on the third day... After rising again, after all these days, he ascended into the heavens and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And the old creed says, and he'll return to judge the quick and the dead, right? That's the Christ event. After Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, a group of people waited, didn't they? Like us. They waited in in a symbol location for the day of Pentecost. Creation, covenant, Christ, church. The fourth thing that God has planned in his plan was to create out of, out of a group of sinners, out of a group of ragtag Jews and Gentiles, out of the poor of the world, out of the fools, according to the scriptures, the Christians were fools early on, out of the fools he decided to create something called his church. It was never heard of before. Brand new. Brand new. Never heard of. 
And God made you and me and he brought us together. And he partnered with us just like God partnered with the covenantal people of the Old Testament. Now the fifth C is the one we're waiting for. That's the consummation. I like C's. The completion, the holy completion. The scriptures say that God's going to finish his story only in the only way that God can in holiness and in completion and perfection. It says that a new heaven and a new earth will come down and be established and God's going to walk up to you individually and wipe away your tears. God's going to take away any of your anxieties or your pain. It says that God's going to physically dwell with us and he will be our God and we will be his people. There's not going to be any need for the sun at night or during the day or the moon at night because God is going to be our light. Pretty wild beautiful. That's the consummation. That's the end of the story. And if you look at at, at three of these, the, the, the first one, the third one, and the fifth one, the creation of the world, the coming of Jesus Christ, and the completion of God's story, those three have in common in that God doesn't really partner with us on those, does he? None. Of, I mean, which one of y'all leg wrestled God into sending his son down here? Yeah, God just did it. How many of you wrote God a handwritten note and begged him to create the world? Not one of us. What about the end? Who can make God bring the income? Make the income? No one. Those three movements in God's story are a, y'all sit back and watch me work. Watch me work. You can glorify me, you can testify to me, but you can't participate in this. You're unable to participate in this. But the second and and the fourth one, the covenantal period, which is the, most of the Old Testament, and the days of the church, those are distinctly parallel to each other. And that God, through these long periods of time, after acting swiftly by his own word, his own hand, partners with a group of mortals. He calls, he collects, he assembles. And just as God took the covenantal people of the Old Testament and had them sit at the foot of Mount Sinai and brought down the, the, the scriptures and brought down the Torah and the Ten Commandments to give them an identity and a covenant, the church was assembled in the same way and sits at the feet of Jesus Christ and waits to receive from the Holy Spirit. Kind of a quick side note. You know the day of Pentecost? That was around. That was a Jewish holy day. You know what Pentecost celebrates? Well, that's what we ce- We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Jewish holy day, 50 days after Passover's 50s Pente, Pentecost. It's a high holy day, and, the, and that was the, the celebration of the Hebrew people, the Jews, would sit and celebrate the day that Moses brought down the Ten Commandments. Isn't that wild? That's the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit from above. It's really cool, the parallels between the covenantal period and the church. Do you all see that? We live in a very similar time as the covenantal people. And I say all that to mean by flying at 10,000 feet, looking at the story of God... That, that, that you and I would grasp today that the time we live in, the era that we live in as the people of God, the church, isn't just a peripheral to God's story. It's not just something that's happening on the side or, or it just doesn't really matter. It's integral to God's story. It's important. We are key role players to the story of the Almighty God. Do you really think, back in the, the stories we read in the Old Testament, that they thought people would be reading stories about them? Do you really think, do you focus that people in heaven, that the saints, that the angels are watching us like we read the Old Testament? Sitting on the edge of their seat in anticipation and suspense, wondering what, like we do with Elijah on Mount Carmel. I love that story. Prophets of Baal and their their battle in Baal. People are sitting on the edge of their seats up in heaven watching the church of Jesus Christ thinking, how are they going to get out of this one? How's God going to glorify them through this? Watching the church that's being persecuted in Iraq today thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And they're watching First Christian Church right now at what's happened between the Holy Spirit bringing my family and y'all together and saying, what's next? What's next? We're part of, you see that? We're part of the story of God and God's wisdom. And I fully disagree with him on this judgment call. God partnered with me and with you, a bunch of sinners that are broken and selfish and greedy and lustful and sad and all these things, and says, I don't care. This is my wisdom. I'm going to assemble a body called the church, and they will have their era. Jesus says in the Great Commission, I will be with you until the end of this age. That's today. This era until we walk with him in the streets. Wow. The things that we live into today are of biblical proportion. 
It's beautiful. And what an awesome and almost terrifying reality that is. And awesome in the truth, awesome like you're standing before a tidal wave about to hit you, like a scary awesome. That we live in a time right now when we get to be God's people, God's church. So why does the world need the church? Why does the world need the church? It's in God's story. And God determined in God's wisdom, the world didn't know they needed Jesus Christ before they came, did we? Before he came. The world didn't need, know that we needed a covenantal God but until he created covenants. The world didn't know we needed a group of people called the church, the, bo- the body, the bride of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, until it was created in the vision and the image of his son Jesus Christ and in God's wisdom. Nobody knew. Who knew this? Only the Father. The world needs the church because God made the world and it's part of God's story. Wow. A few of you, particularly staff, I ask this question. Why do you think the world needs the church? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you, why do you serve a church instead of, why don't, why don't you work at Dell? Why don't you work at your old company, Jim? Why the church? And these are what I heard. What other body on earth is created to embody the Holy Spirit? What other collection of human sinners is ordained and committed to preserving the scriptures, to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, to sharing the sacraments, to spreading the gospel. Who else? What other body of believers, body of folks, is created to give the world a relationship with Jesus Christ? Who else? Let's pray. Lord, we ask in this moment that you put on our hearts a thick seal of your spirit. We pray, Lord, that we would stand in awe of the time that we get to live in. We pray, Lord, that we would recognize that, that where we are and, and how we live and, and the, the people we're assembled together where they're not an accident, but they're ordained in your wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you would give us not just the humility and, and the submission that we, that we desperately need, Lord, to follow you and your son, Jesus Christ, but that you would also give us the Holy Spirit, the commission, the empowerment, so that just as we read back of the biblical heroes of the Old Testament, the angels above would look on our story and just smile. Make us your people, God, and may in all things your church stand faithful. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.
Now there's something I believe we've all experienced before. I believe that is being in a crowd. I'm very introverted, and so when there's a lot of people around me, uh, I get claustrophobic, uncomfortable, all right? It reminded me of Rock the Desert. We just went on a youth trip to Rock the Desert, and you're in crowds. You're watching the bands that you like to see perform. And so there gets to be a point in the Midland heat, 100 plus degrees, where all you can start thinking about is the crowdedness. It's hot, there's people around you, why is everyone yelling at nothing? You know, you're just, you're just really confused to all you can think about is the crowdedness. Until there's a guy, a few people actually, volunteers, and they come around with this like bug repellent can thing, but it's filled with water. And they pump it and then they spray the crowd and it's just like this cool water coming over you and suddenly it's like, oh, and it's some relief. And suddenly you start to realize, oh, the band's there. Oh, everything's good. I think our lives are the same way. I think often through the week, we get into a trend of busyness. And the crowdedness around us gets to us. It's where all we can think about is that. And this, this table here, that is our fresh water. That is what replenishes us every week where we realized, ah, this is our mission. And we understand that on that last night when Jesus was gathered with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he presented it to them. And he said, here, take a knee. This is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. Shall we pray? Pray with me. Caring God, we come together in thanksgiving for your blessing of daily bread. Even as we break together the bread of the Spirit, grant that our individual communion prayers may be acceptable in your sight. In memory of Jesus, we come to this table. May your presence inspire us to renew our dedication to the task of Christian witness and service. Amen. Amen. And in a similar manner, we read that Jesus takes a cup and pouring wine of the day, he then offers it to his disciples. And he says, take and drink. This is my blood of the covenant shed for you. Do this and remember me. Shall we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are again blessed to be in your house and to receive this invitation to your table for all that are here. We are reminded at this table of your marvelous and everlasting love when you gave your son Jesus his body on the Christ, on the cross. His blood flowing out for the forgiveness of our sins and His resurrection giving us the opportunity for everlasting life. If we follow Your Word, love You, love each other, we pray that Thy will, not ours, be done in our lives this week. Amen. Here at First Christian Church, in this service, we take communion by intinction, which means our servers will be out here on the sides. You can come down the center aisle, break off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and ingest it. There's also some baskets at the end if you would uh, wish to put your offering in those baskets, and also some prayer tables if you want to choose to have this time as a time of prayer. If you aren't able to get up from your seat, communion will be brought to you, but please come forward as we take communion together.
Father, we thank you. Thank you for all the many blessings you give us, God, but especially this gift here. Your blood and your, your body you've given to us, God. And most importantly, your life. God, we, we pray that we are always seeking new ways and old ways to glorify your name. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the blessings of today. Not too much that we may become greedy, and not too little that we may steal, but just enough for today, our daily bread. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Every Sunday we have an opportunity to do something special, and that's to open our arms and give an off- offer a very real invitation to people to respond to God. We've responded at his table. And uh, if today's the day that, that you feel called to come forward and for the first time say, I choose, Lord, I choose to recognize that your story has, is an invitation for me to become part of it. And I want to be part of that, Lord. Or if you'd like to come forward and say that you would like First Christian Church to be your worshiping community, if it's become clear to you that this is to be your church home that you long to commit to, to your brothers and sisters here, please come forward and receive the right hand of Christian fellowship so that we can pray for you. And lastly, if you'd just like to come talk to me after church. That's what I'm here for. Let's stand.
Church, I'd like to introduce you to your new brother, Andrew Lumborg. He has been with us for a couple of weeks, actually just two weeks now. He comes from Tennessee. He uh, was born and raised in the Methodist Church, and he wishes to place his membership and his care in us and through Jesus Christ's church here at First Christian Church. Grab your red hymnals. Hold us to what we're about to tell you. Grab your red hymnals and turn to page 341. And get ready. Andrew, I'm going to ask you the same question that you were asked when you were baptized or confirmed and offer you my right hand. Andrew, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess Him as your Lord and Savior? I do. Amen. God bless you. Good job. Thanks. Please join me. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. After the service, Andrew and I will remain here up front. And you're, feel free to come forward and offer him a big hug and a handshake. Join me now for our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.